Hey, you. Yeah, you. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? We're two busy moms and boss ladies. If we can do it, you can too. When we were trying to get this podcast off the ground, we had a lot of questions. How do we record an episode? How do we get our show into all the apps people like to listen to? How do we make money from a podcast? The answer to every one of these questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now, Anchor can match you with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's what we're doing right now by reading this ad. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm slash start to join us in the diverse community of podcasters already using Anchor. That's anchor.fm slash start. We can't wait to hear your podcast. You're listening to Boss Ladies and Babies with Mickey and Megan, two best friends adventuring through motherhood, building our careers, and and not losing losing our shit. Welcome back to Boss Ladies and Babies. This is Megan. And this is Mickey. You guys, the time has come. Mickey and I are about to be reunited for the first time in like a freaking year and a half. This yeah. Is maybe the longest we've ever gone without seeing each other in yeah. our whole career of friend- being friends. Oh, yeah. It has to be. I can't imagine why would we would be kept this apart for so long other than a global pandemic. So mm-hmm. I can't wait to see you. I, can't I might wait. cry. I'm, I'm probably going to cry. I'm definitely going to cry. We're so excited. So we are recording this episode with just like a little extra pep in our steps, knowing that we're going to be seeing each other so soon. And we also had just an amazing guest on this episode. I am so excited to share this conversation with you all. This this was just such a great topic. We talked about parenting in 2021 and beyond, and we really went all over the map in this conversation. We covered the pandemic. We covered Black Lives Matter. We covered basically every deep, helpful, (laughs) just beautiful, hard topic that is involved in parenting that we could cover in an hour, and it was it was magical. <laughs> it was. It could have been a three-hour episode, but we had to, we had to let her go. <laughs> but well, before we bring her on and get diving into parenthood, um, let's get started with our highs and lows. Sure, I'll go. I'll go first. Yeah. Okay. So, um, my high. I don't know. The highs, honestly, the highs kind of hard to think of. I I think probably my high is just going to be that we are going on a trip to Bellingham and that we're going to be reunited with you guys and we're going to see all of our friends that we haven't seen in like a year and our family and we're getting like the cutest little Airbnb that has a heated pool, which is amazing. And there's supposed to be a hot tub that will be there by the time that we get there. It's not there quite yet. There's like an acre of land with a bocce ball court and just like all sorts of fun stuff. And we've never been on a vacation, the three of us before. Like we've gone on trips with Nora and like our family, but we haven't ever gone anywhere, just the three of us. So we're really excited to just go stay in our own space and like be able to see everybody and do all the Bellingham things that we used to love doing and just like have that little family time. So that would probably be my high. I've just been really struggling recently (laughs) as I'm sure a lot of us have. So, um, low, I don't know. (laughs) I'm not going to make this all like (laughs) a thing. So I would just say my low, you guys, something really creepy happened recently in our neighborhood um, I saw on like Facebook that there had been car prowlers going around our neighborhood, which it's like one thing to hear about that. It's like, ooh, that's creepy. Like, hope my car was locked kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But we actually got recordings from our neighbors mm-hmm. and we saw the guys like with their flashlights, like peeking into each of our cars, ooh. like walking through our driveway while we were upstairs sleeping, which just like adds a whole extra layer of like, what the F? Like, yeah. it was. It was so cringy and just like 
really, really scary. Luckily, nothing happened like to us or our house or our cars or anything. But um, they were like grown men prowling oh, yeah. the neighborhood. It was ugh, disgusting. So that happened recently, which wasn't super fun. But yeah, what about you? Um, I need a second to like, <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> See, on video is just so much worse than uh-huh. hearing about it too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad you, got, you yeah, guys are fine okay. and everything. Um, okay, let's see. Um, my high is that Piper had her first sleepover this weekend, which was such a big deal. Um, it was just at one of our like really good friends' houses. They've um, I've been friends with the moms since like, well before we were even married or had kids. So um, kind of she spends a lot of time there. So it's like a second home, easy transition to a first sleepover thing. Um, and she had a great time. And it's just such a big deal because I feel like looking back, one, we were like 90s kids. So I understand my childhood was a lot different than hers. But also having been through a pandemic, I'm like, by the time I was in second grade, I was having like sleepover birthday parties with my friends and like doing all this stuff. And she doesn't have like do play dates. Like we don't spend time with people outside of school hardly at all, except family. So it was just like a little milestone that I'm really glad that she got to experience and it was safely. And, um, we can just feel really good that she got to feel like a normal kid for a minute. How did she do? Was, was it okay? Everything was fine. I, I stayed for a while. Um, to hang out and I went to go say goodbye and she was like, okay, bye. (laughs) Like, get out of here. (laughs) She was like, she's like getting to the point where now she like gets embarrassed of me. So that's cool. (laughs) I have a 13 year old, (laughs) but no, it went great. She had so much fun and they loved her and yeah, it went really well. Nice. Um, Let's see. My low will be that we are getting our second COVID vaccine tomorrow, which isn't a bad thing except my anxiety around it is horrendous. I am like terrified. I didn't do well with the first one, but like just going into it, knowing so many people had reactions. I'm just so, I've been so stressed out about it. And then now it's like, okay, it's this week. Okay. It's in a couple days. Okay. It's tomorrow. I'm like just really stressed out. So tomorrow, I mean, (laughs) yeah, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure it'll be fine, but I just like, need to relax a little bit before I do that at least my husband's going with me so it won't be so scary it's good yeah it is it's intimidating knowing what to expect kind of but like realistically how many people do you know that really did get sick like I know Quentin and I got we had pretty bad reactions from it but most everyone else that I actually know didn't Mm -hmm. have much of a reaction so Mm -hmm. that's good the odds are, you know, and, and if you get sick, you're sick for a day and then you're right. fine. And yeah. at least, you know, it worked. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then we yeah. get to somewhat go back to real life, which I'm like, so, so excited about. So it's a good thing. Just making me nervous. Yeah. That's all. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely nerve wracking. It's like one of those times you wish we could have just been a one shot, you know, cause yeah. then you get it over with once, yeah. but you're yeah. doing the right thing and I'm proud oh, yeah. of you. I know yeah. it's scary. And then you could take your mask off. I just know. Kidding. I'm like, just kidding. I will never. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, my goodness. We're on that in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into our episode because we are both so excited. Our guest is the digital content director for the Parents brand, which includes heading up the content for parents.com and its social platforms. She is a single co-parenting mama to her four-year-old daughter and has been writing and editing in the parenting space for over 13 years and an editor in general for more than 16 years. And she has a passion for covering all the wonderfully unique ways people parent and form their families. She has been the co-host to the podcast Pregnancy Confidential and now the host of a new podcast, We Are Family, with Sean T. from Insanity Workouts. And they talk all about the diversity of families and life in America today. She's also appeared as a panel moderator and expert on the parenting beat for various TV shows and events, including Good Morning America, CNN, Yahoo, and local news networks. She has been just the most incredible person to talk with. We cover so much in this episode and we are so excited to bring on to the show Julia Dennison right after this break. (laughs) 
Hey, boss lady, we want to support you and your business on our show. We've rolled out a new segment where we will be highlighting boss ladies in our community by running an ad for your business. KP Metalworks is a woman and mom owned welding and metal fabrication company based in Bellingham, Washington. With 25 years of experience in structural and artistic welding, KP Metalworks will bring your custom metal project to life with integrity, durability, and individuality. Check them out at kpmetalworks.com or on social media at KP Metalworks. If you're interested in us promoting you on our show, send us an email and let's get bossy. Hello, Julia. Welcome to the show. We're so glad you're here with us today to talk all about parenting in 2021 and beyond. Oh my goodness. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. That's my, my favorite topic that I feel like (laughs) (laughs) life and work kind of come together on that one for me. So. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Well, before we get started, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself, what you do, who you are, what makes you a boss lady? Um, Well, thank you. So I am Julia. I am the digital content director at Parents Magazine. And what that means is that I oversee all the editorial on parents.com and the social channels. And I'm also a mom to almost five-year-old Esme, who I call Ezzy. And I'm a single mom. I co-parent with her dad. I split the time half and half. He's a few blocks away. I live here in Queens, New York. Um, and I've been sort of surviving this pandemic the way we all have, which is juggling, you know, working full-time managing a team and also having my daughter. And luckily she's in preschool now full-time and we're, but we're kind of looking at kindergartens now and getting her enrolled there. And my number one requirement is it's gotta be open. Please be open because it's, I can't even remember some of the months of this pandemic have been just a blur, but anyway, that's me in a short intro (laughs) and, um, yeah, so happy to be here. Oh my gosh. We're so, so excited to have you here. First of all, I love your daughter's name. That is (laughs) so beautiful. And second of all, being in New York. So you, we had it really bad here in Washington back at like the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. You sort of had it started with you all out there. I remember that Mm because our Seattle, we have, we have an office at Meredith is our parent company and we have an office in Seattle. And I remember like, it's sort of the conversations really started out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty scary, but then you guys in New York ended up getting hit Mm -hmm. so badly with it. How are things kind of now? How are things going? Yeah. For a while here in Queens, where I live was the epicenter of the epicenter in Elmhurst. And I remember that was really, really bad during the pandemic. Um, now we're kind of coming on out of it. And as of today is the day when our governor said that we can start not wearing masks inside. And I know a lot of parents out there are feeling mixed about that because kids Mm -hmm. are still kids under 12 are still not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's still, there are still so many questions where, you know, whether to wear the mask, where to wear the mask, when to wear the mask should be, you know, all those things. And I think like, there's never a dull moment when you're covering parenting ever generally, <laughs> but certainly in the last year and a half, it's been kind of wild, you know, yes. you all have experienced. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's, there's just like no right decisions. I feel like as a parent during this time. Yeah. And, <laughs> well, and a ton of questions about mm-hmm. what you should do, which is where our job comes in as a website, you know, our tra- predominantly our traffic comes from search and people Googling stuff. So mm-hmm. we try to make sure we answer every single question question a parent would ever have and you know we always say that like it doesn't you know parenting doesn't change all that much you know so a lot of those you know a lot of our content has been around for a really long time and then we update and refresh it and it's sometimes hard to find new searched you know co- topics to cover for mm-hmm. um for people searching but the pandemic obviously yeah. <laughs> delivered those questions <laughs> and then some um because it's just every day it feels like there's more questions and now obviously it's all about kids and vaccines and you know yes. when we can expect them etc for kids under 12 so. yeah I can't even mm-hmm. imagine but it must be wild well let's we'll get more into the pandemic talk but <laughs> let's kind of get to know a little bit more about you obviously your resume is incredible and you've been in this parenting space for all of these years which is amazing so let's kind of get into this by kicking off and hearing more about your role at parents and how you got started doing what you do um, you're so sweet. Thank you. I, um, 
I, you know, I've always been a journalist and I've always been an editor and I've always adored, you know, doing the job I do. I think when I graduated college, I feel like I, I, I knew I wanted to write and I knew I, I wanted to get paid to write. And I was like, okay, let's make that happen. And that was a windy path. So I lived in, um, after college, I lived in London for 10 years actually. And I was working in health journalism and education journalism. And I remember I had this, had to make this decision as to whether I would stay in the UK and if I wanted to have kids and have kids there and have like the most amazing maternity leave or come back to the States where I had my village and my parents and everybody who could support me. And in the end, I chose to come back to the States and choose the village, which I still think is the best, was the best decision, even though I do think that the UK is, you know, obviously doing it right when it comes to maternity leave. Like, I think they can get up to a year off there. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be much more like that over here. But my village, you know, has been so, so helpful, um, especially so... Um, I moved over and I started working for Fit Pregnancy magazine um, and Natural Health magazine. And I kind of got into that job because of the Natural Health magazine element. I was sort of in interested in the health angle. And I was like, all right, this was before I was a parent. I was like, okay, I'll work on the Fit Pregnancy side of things too. But I'm not really kind of like that invested in the parenting angle. Um, but then I, though, as I was working there, I was like, this is either going to make me really want to have a kid or it's going to make me not at all <laughs> <laughs> like too much information. But of course, in the end, you know, there's like too many cute babies featured in that magazine. So, um, I definitely ended up giving in and having a kid, um, with my then husband who is British, all, who was, who is British, but he's not my husband anymore. But, um, and, uh, and then eventually fit pregnancy got acquired by by meredith the parent company to parents and fit pregnancy folded and the website fit pregnancy eventually got shut down and brought all the content kind of brought under the parents umbrella and i at the time i was working on print and digital but it kind of went full digital in terms of my job and then i ended up um, becoming the site lead for parents.com, which kind of swallowed up all this other, these other kind of parent, we have parenting.com also, which is a sister site. Um, but parents.com is the mothership. And, um, and so I was kind of brought the up in journalism and in, in magazines and the editorial world, there's always the print versus digital. And I was kind of brought over to the exclusively digital side. And now I'm really glad I, that I'm there because obviously, you know, that's where people are reading content, but also it's the fun stuff. Like get to look at the metrics and see what people are reading and see what people are searching and make sure that you are providing content for those people. Um, and so, yeah, that's my backstory. And now I've been here since 2015. So six years now at parents and I love it. And, you know, I think it's, it's a dream for me because I'm really creating content that I would I find important in my life mm -hmm. stage right now. And so I feel very privileged, mostly the fact that I can like if I feel like I want more information on a subject, I can like commission amazing, amazing writers and have an amazing editorial team to kind of answer my questions. Right. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I try to make sure that it's not like a, that it's not a crutch, that I don't just assume my experience as a white cisgender mom who lives in New York City is single mom who lives in New York City is everybody else's experience. So I think that's part of my challenge as, a, as you know, running the editorial is just to really make sure that we're telling all the stories of what parenthood looks like to everybody. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at now. And it's been, you know, it's been a great journey. And now I'm, I feel like, very happy to be on my parenting beat <laughs> so to speak yeah. sounds amazing yeah oh well I bet it was interesting also going through those work transitions and then becoming a parent yourself because mm -hmm. as much as you uh, everyone thinks that they know about parenting and all of that before having a kid which you can be so well versed but then throwing the actual living parenthood is <laughs> so <laughs> such a big it's transition so different I remember yeah. my OBGYN when I was pregnant was like you have no questions and I was like <laughs> uh it's <laughs> because my job is to like think about pregnancy all the time and right. um I, I'm good but thank you <laughs> but it's so true I they always say like you're the the parent that um, like you, the, the version of you as a parent before you were a parent is always like the better parent and then you become a parent and it's <laughs> like all the things you said you wouldn't do all of a sudden here you are um but anyway we do our yeah. best <laughs> survival <laughs> mode survival yeah, mode always yeah. all the time now more than ever for sure <laughs> so what, what was the transition like for you when you became a parent um I think hmm you know
know, it was like just pretty, because I had been sort of deeply into the parent. For me, I feel like it was very lucky that I was working um, for parents and working for fit pregnancy at the time because um, it was, I was in a very supportive um you know, work environment. So I was very lucky to have, it's almost like an asset. If you have a kid, (laughs) you know, you definitely don't need to have a kid to work, uh, work for our (laughs) brand. We have plenty of people who don't, and they do a great job, but, um, it does make it some things easier just because you can kind of make those gut decisions about, uh, about editorial. But then also I think it's just kind of like par for the course. There's so many parents, obviously at parents. So it's like another kind of, it's like a very welcoming place to become a parent. And, um, it just kind of happened at a point in my life where it just felt really kind of good and, and, and happy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it had its challenges. So I separated from my then husband when my daughter was one, Um, So I was kind of juggling all of that and transitioning over to become a single mom pretty early in motherhood. And um, even though like, as we speak, I just saw that um, my daughter's dad messaged me something on Instagram, like we're very close and we we co-parent well and we split our time and we try to be very civil and that's a very important thing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was a lot. It was sort of like becoming, oh, because I also got promoted to site lead. Uh, while I was on maternity leave, which was awesome and a total blessing. Um, But so it was like, kind of like over maternity leave, like new motherhood, you know, navigating my relationship and then also navigating my career all at the same time, but very lucky to be in the supportive environment of working for parents. So there. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that sounds, yeah. Just like a lot at once, but that's, yeah. I feel like but that's, that's life. Like that's yeah, parenthood. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Parenthood. Exactly. It's like, we just <laughs> get everything at once and then we'll have like some downtime for a while and then it will all happen again. I know. And but, then when you have the downtime, it's so rare. You're like, what do I do? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I feel that all the time. Well, okay. So I was pretty surprised when you said that things that parents are asking hasn't really changed that much over the years because you've been in the parenting space for like 13 ish years or so. Yeah. Right? Well, I've definitely been publishing for 13 years and worked in sort of health publishing. I've probably worked in the parenting space and publishing for like seven, seven or eight years now. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I've only been a parent for like two and a half years. Right. And so mm-hmm. in my head, I'm just imagining like there's all these different trends that people are doing and things are so different from when we were kids. But when Mm -hmm. you mentioned that, like that makes sense that the core of parenting as a whole probably really hasn't changed that much. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said trends, like, I think there are trends, but like parent, there's a lot about parenthood that's not like trendy and doesn't necessarily change. Of course, there are like basic things like babies need to sleep on their back now. And we know that, and there can be no blankets in the crib, you know, all of that. Um, whereas growing up, I think like kids were asleep while they're probably sleeping wherever, but like, you know, on their stomach. So there's basic things that do obviously change, but, and I think things fluctuate. So I was just talking to someone earlier about how, um, she was saying, oh, when I grew up, I was a latchkey kid. Can you believe that? Like, I would just let myself in and like, my parents would let me go and like play with out all day when I was eight. And I was like, well, yeah, but then now it's sort of like going full circle because we had the helicopter phase of parenthood, Mm -hmm. but now there's a lot of evidence that millennial parents are much more likely to kind of let their kids have a little bit more space and freedom and, and push back on that kind of, um, that, that sort of like helicopter desire to be in every single detail of their child's life. And you hear about things like free range parenting and like, let it not say, you know, there's a happy medium, like, and you have to use your judgment, but I think like there's definitely fluctuating and sometimes it feels like things come full circle Mm -hmm. um and things like I laugh when there are trends like um for example baby led weaning which is basically just like give your kid (laughs) yeah instead of purees and you know instead of baby food just give your kid what you're eating and I call that like like when lazy parenting like meets what's actually good for the kid that's like my favorite that's my jam because I did baby led weaning and I was like and for me I was just like oh this is great like I don't have to do fancy purees or I don't have to like you know go buy really expensive baby food you mean I can just like make what I'm making for dinner and then give her a version of that yes please sign me up because it just felt like you know, something that was just a little bit easier on the parents, but also good for them. And the same thing for during the pandemic, I think especially is independent play and how important it is to like, let your kid play on their own. 
Um, and you don't have to be their entertainer and you don't have to be in every single detail of their, you know, their life and managing the stage manager for their play. Um, and that's okay. And that's actually beneficial and they're going to be fine. I think that's another example where it's like, okay, good. good Cause I, I can, I got to take a meeting over here, you know, like, yeah. so when you find out that things like that, um, make it your life easier, but then also are good for the kids. I love it. That. That's like, but that's stuff that I think previous generations are kind of like, uh, like with baby led weaning they were like, you have a phrase for that. Like we yeah. were just handing the, you know, handing this, the potato over to our kid, just letting them play with it. Like it was no thing. And, you know, so <laughs> that's why I say, I think it sort of fluctuates and sometimes comes full circle. Yeah. That makes sense. And then just, you know, the world changes so much and we know so much more about safety and things like that and yep. than what we did before. So it makes sense that things would kind of just adjust a bit. Um, but yeah. what would be like the biggest change that you've seen since you've been in the parenting space to now, and it could be pandemic or not pandemic related. Um, I think, hmm, I'd say the biggest change in the last year is around screen time, just because I think we, um, screen time is always a source of guilt for parents and it always has been. And I think that's a perfect example of a thing that I remember before I had my daughter, I was like, I read a study. Cause I, that was the thing. It was like, I saw all the studies. So then I read a study that's like, kids do not benefit from screens whatsoever until, or any kind of TV or any kind of media whatsoever until they're like seven or eight years old, at least. And I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> like, and you're already laughing like, oh, okay. Then I will wait and she won't have anything until she's seven or eight years old. Well, of course that goes out the window. This is even pre-pandemic, you know, it's yeah. like, you're just like trying to survive here. So of course, like kids get screen time, but of course it's like a huge source of guilt, um, for many parents. And then, um, pandemic hit and all of a sudden the screens were like where the kids interacted with their teachers, where they mm -hmm. FaceTimed with their, you know, grandparents and all of a sudden screens were so central, but not only that, but screens were, were how I was able to do meetings and was there was March during March, 2020 through June, I think, or even further where I was literally splitting the time still with my, with, with my ex. So I had Ezzy half the time, but when I had Ezzy, I had her, I had no help. It was just me and her. And somehow I was also doing my job. I don't remember any of that, but I was able to do that because of, of screens. Like, and that's just the reality of it. And it was one of those things where I was like, I have mama has to do her job. <laughs> I have to put a roof over this head, uh, over our heads and food on the table. Mm -hmm. And, um, we, I have to do what I have to do. And so I think like, luckily the AAP and had like issued some lenience around screen time to just at least to make us feel all a little bit less guilty. But then of course they turned around and they were like, well, we didn't expect you to be using on screens this much for this long. Right. Um, so I think it's, I don't know. I think like, I don't know if it's anything's changed there. I think that there are people are a bit more willing to talk about the fact that screens is a perfect example of, of we, of us all trying to do our best. And, and I think like, we have to give ourselves a little bit of a, of a break over some of these things. And, um, and I even think sometimes you do, you have hand them an iPad so that you can have a a moment to yourself or a moment to give yourself just a pause and, and, you know, do nothing yourself. And that's important too. And I think, I think in terms of what's changing is I think moms, I've noticed moms are much better about not feeling sorry, guilty for taking that me time and realizing that like that self-care is not just like good for them, but I think good for their kids because, you know, it, the, the happy mom is, is everyone's happier when mom's happy and it's all connected and, and how important, uh, our mental health is and all of this and acknowledging that. So yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's, and also just getting rid of that sort of perfect, that's striving to be the perfect parent. I've seen that change a lot over the last, you know, almost decade that I've been working in this space. I feel like we're just talking about it a lot more, like the whole, yeah everybody's idea of how they should present themselves is shifting so much. And we're starting mm -hmm. to lean so much more to like, let's be relatable and let's show people yeah. the behind the scenes of our lives. And that's really important. I think that's helping with parenting a lot as well, because we can say like, I didn't do great today. And that's okay. Because I know there's other people out there who also didn't do great. And let's lift yep. each other up about it instead of tear each other down, which I think is really Definitely. beautiful. Yeah. That's what I try to do with, with, my brand. And that's what I try to do personally on my social media. I just try to be as honest as possible because I figure whatever I'm doing, if it's helping other people, 
and you know, and that's why I say things like, listen, if you need to hand, if I, like, if you need to hand them an iPad so that you can just have a moment to breathe, like, that's what I do. Like, you know, yeah. they'll be fine. They'll be yeah. fine. In fact, they'll probably be better off because you'll be <laughs> a little bit happier yourself. So, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and I mean, regardless of whatever amount of screen time that kids as a collective have had over the past like pandemic year, I mean, that difference must be so minuscule compared to all the other huge changes that they're going through especially when they're going through this pandemic during like those really formative socializing years Mm -hmm. and everyone's stuck at home so Mm -hmm. if my kids you know come out a little weird from too many cartoons or whatever I'm okay with that because they're probably gonna have a lot of other things to be worrying (laughs) about getting reintroduced into (laughs) society totally yeah I think you know the for me the playground has been the VIP of the last few months just that's where my daughter's been getting a lot of her social interaction outside of school and so so valuable um and yeah also I'm a big proponent of sitting on the the playground bench putting my airpods in listening to a podcast and letting her do her thing and you know trying to just sit back and use that as a time for for myself too yeah it's relaxing for both of you guys to get out of the house and just be out in the world safely and just take a minute and yeah Mm -hmm. I like that too yeah so I know it's been really challenging on all of us going through this pandemic I mean as adults do you have any advice on how that we can manage our fears and continue to be brave for all of our little kids out there Oh gosh, it's so hard. Um, well, so first of all, I think that it's really important to not feel like you have to be too brave. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to be open about your emotions with your kids. Like, you know, make sure that they know that they're safe and looked after and make sure that, you know, that, that you're always out there to look for out for their well being. But I think it's also okay to, to, you know, if you're feeling sad or if you're missing a friend or you're missing your friends or you're missing your family, um, you know, you don't have to put on that brave face. And I think it's beneficial to the kids if you don't, you know, to a certain extent, and just to show them that you, that it's okay to feel those feelings. And that's, I think, a change that's also come around within parenthood too. You know, I think previous generations might've felt like they needed to really put on a brave face and like not show weakness. Mm -hmm. Um, But actually, I think that that, that like that vulnerability is so beneficial to the kids because they need to, you know, learn by, you need to lead by example and they need to be able to see that it's okay to have a range of emotions. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel scared. Mm-hmm. So I think, and it's okay to talk about that. So I think it's totally fine to, to, to have those conversations, but I mean, in terms of your own personal worries, I mean, there's so many, and I have to hear so many of my friends kind of going through it right now, especially as we're waiting for kids to get, um, the, okay, kids under 12 to get the, okay, to get vaccinated. Um, And, you know, just a lot of questions and concerns and, and worry. And I think it's like, that's the thing. I remember when I, one of the transitions, when I became a mom, as I remember being in the hospital and I was like, oh shoot, like my heart was literally outside of my body now in my form of my child. And there's only so much control I have over them. Holy crap. Like that was a real like scary moment. And I remember I said to my mom, I was like, does this anxiety feeling ever go away? And she's like, nope. (laughs) she's like you know I don't remember how old I was I I guess I was like 34 or something at the 33 at the time and she's like no you know you're 33 and I still have those feelings about you too and it's like oh shoot that's like motherhood right there and I think that that's that's what people a lot of people are feeling right now is that um their kids still feel very vulnerable to them um and so it's it's hard it's a really hard time to be, there's so much to worry about with kids, whether that's, you know, social, socializing, the academic slide, the vulnerability with the pandemic and, you know, just COVID in general, it's just a lot, it's our, it's already really stressful to be a parent. And it's already like a million things that are on your mental load of thoughts and worries to add all of that of the pandemic. It's, you know, it's a lot, but I think the kids are going to be okay. <laughs> I have to think we just have to hope okay. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I think I do think there's an element of like they're very resilient mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know my daughter she puts a mask on like she puts her socks on like yeah. it's not she almost doesn't even remember a time before which you know she's almost five but she will barely remembers probably a time before it at this point it's so it's so normal to her so I think sometimes some of these fears are more us mm-hmm. experiencing them than even the kids like the kids are <laughs> the kids are probably more fine than we realize, I think. Um, and we're getting, hopefully seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but not, has not been, I think this has been the hardest year and a half for, to be a parent 
like yeah. at least in a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like that you said that about it's harder on us than the kids because I'm, I know we all are, but this last week, especially I've been having a really, really hard time with mm-hmm. in Washington, or I guess it's everywhere. Now they're saying unvaccinated can be unmasked, mm-hmm. but, and so it's like this mixture of emotions because it's like, there is this light at the end of the tunnel, but then, Oh wait, like I still have my kid at home. Right. And yeah. it's just brought up like all the anxiety from the beginning again, yeah. just like tenfold. Mm-hmm. And it's been like, so overwhelming. I'm going to get emotional about it. I it's know. Just, like, yeah. Oh, rough, I mean, right. But it's so often, true. I'm like finding myself as I'm like venting to my friends and family about it. I'm like, and I know it's so much harder on me than it is on her. Like she doesn't even realize like yeah. when we leave a group of unmasked kids, because I'm not comfortable with her playing with them, mm-hmm. it's harder on me than it is her. She doesn't even really know any different. And I've been really thankful that she's the age that she is for all of this because she's so little. Mm-hmm. I can't even imagine having like school age kids, but at the same time, I'm also like, but she doesn't like, she doesn't remember anything before this. And she doesn't really know what it's like to play with a bunch of kids and without like me putting that anxiety out there. And it's just like, I'm just sharing this because if anybody's feeling the same way that I am about this, and I'm sure mm-hmm. many of us are like, it's okay thought, every- to, like be upset. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And this is such a common feeling that so many of my friends are having too. Yeah. Um, and I actually met up with a friend of mine who she's in politics and she, she made a really great point that like kids can't vote. So obviously, so oftentimes it feels like decisions are made for, for, for the people who can vote or for people who make a difference in terms of being money and spending power. So yeah. I think like, that's a perfect example where, you know, kids are still vulnerable. And if people are going to be unmasked inside you're it's an honorous system that those people are vaccinated and you don't know. And then even if your kid, you know, and if your kid's wearing your mask, their mask, then I, you should be, you know, pretty much that's, they're going to be very protected, but at the same time, you know, like it does sort of open up all of this extra anxiety um that you're reliant on everybody to go and get vaccinated and do it if they're not vaccinated wear their masks and you know and I was thinking about that too with going back to the office um because we're so we're having that conversation conversation now and I was sort of like I feel more comfortable going back to the office if um the kids are vaccinated because even though it's a probably a small chance that I could bring it could you know bring it back to one because I'm fully vaccinated now that I could bring it to my daughter but at the same time like until she's until I feel like she's protected I'm always going to be worrying you know getting on the subway and everything else Mm -hmm. um and it does sort of feel like we're kind of sweeping through these decisions of opening things up and going back to normal and I do feel like hey hey wait 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 the kids but what about the kids and I think we're probably almost there but we're not there yet and they and they met you know and that was I went today when I spoke to my to the friend of mine who's in politics and she said that I was like that's so true and it feels like that's happening now like they're just making these decisions for uh, to open up businesses which is important but like you know that the kids are still so vulnerable hopefully not for that much longer yeah but you know yeah for sure yeah it's almost like we're like us as parents are back to just quarantining like obviously not as bad as before but I mean I'm not comfortable now again like just it just I think it's so upsetting because it brings up the fears and all of those emotions from the very beginning of the pandemic, like back to being stuck at home and, you know, just like anxious all over again. And it's just, it's hard. (laughs) I do think like the best thing parents can do is get vaccinated themselves and make sure, you know, if once you're fully vaccinated in those two weeks after your second vaccine, if it's the, the, um, Pfizer or Moderna or, or two weeks after the Johnson and Johnson, then, um, you're very protect you're protected and then you're it's it's you're much safer around your kid too so I think that that like once you do that there is some reassurance there um and again like the kids I mean my daughter's so good at wearing her mask it's kind of almost gets me emotional seeing how good she is at it because it's that's every now and then it strikes you like how bizarre these circumstances really are um and now she's like picky about her masks too because she's (laughs) coming up to five where she's picky about her outfits and now she's picky about which mask goes with which outfit and I'm like oh lord (laughs) Another, I don't know. <laughs> this just adds a whole nother level of complication to get her out the door. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's, it's wild. 
I remember when we were just starting to talk about the kids going back in person, like just the beginning whispers. And I was like, I'm sorry, you expect my kids to go to school for six, seven hours with a mask on all day? One, that sounds impossible. Good luck. (laughs) Two, I just thought that it would be so creepy. I don't know. I just really thought that it'd be like scary for the kids to go back and have the teachers are like wearing the masks and face shields. And Mm -hmm. I was like, is this going to be traumatic? But they are so resilient. Like you said earlier, my kids, I mean, perfect example. Yeah. Sometimes they like forget that they even have their mask on still Mm -hmm. on like the ride home. I'm like, Mm -hmm. you can take it off and like take a break. And they're, I mean, that's what's asked of them and that's what they do and they've been handling it really well I feel like as a as a whole totally totally um and that's I same like my daughter's just been you know you watch the little videos from pre-k and you see them all in their masks and everybody it's yeah. yeah it's sort of it's surreal but they are they're they're very good at it in fact I think sometimes they're better than than we are as adults <laughs> at all yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely well let's shift gears a little bit because we could all go on about the pandemic <laughs> parenting forever I know we can but so let's let's switch a little bit um so aside from being an amazing boss lady of course you're also co-parenting mom to your daughter so can you share your experience with co-parenting sure so I remember um Growing up, I always heard stories. My grandparents had a really tough divorce and I always heard divorce as a bad word growing up. It was like, you know, and my dad always said as a a child of of his parents who'd had a bad divorce, I'd always said, I wish that parents could go to divorce school when they get divorced. And I always sort of remember that at the back of my head, not ever thinking that I was like going to get divorced because no one ever like thinks that's going to happen. But I always knew that if that ever did happen, it's something I wanted to make sure I did really, really right. And I remember when that looked like was what, what the direction we were all, we were going in, um, especially working for parents, I'd seen so many studies about how beneficial it was for to, to for um, kids to have equal access to dad and mom. Um, and I was very adamant about that. And I'd read some books. So um, I was, a, I'm a big fan of Emma Johnson writes a book called the kick-ass single mom. And she really just kind of like frames single motherhood in, in this way that's like, and very, very empowering and, but pivotal to that. And at the core of her argument is to, to argue for default equal parenting. Um, some States, when you, when you divorce the, the custody defaults to, to equal shared parenting, and it, you'd have to argue otherwise as to why, you know, why one parent needs more than the other, but New York state's not like that. And I definitely experienced going through my divorce, a lot of kind of frankly kind of sexist conversation around the fact that like moms are somehow more deserving to be you know to have the kid more than the dad and you know um even my lawyer would say things like oh but you want majority custody you do and I was like well no I mean I get a I you know I adore her dad he's the the, he's like the best dad in the world I think and he's excellent and I don't want to take time I don't want to take her away um from him but on top of that there's also a ton of evidence that shows that in divorce and in custody, if that, that women really benefit from equal custody, they get paid more, they have more advancement in their career. Um, there are so many benefits to sharing that. It's not always possible. Absolutely not. But when it's possible, it's, it's something that is, you know, I think very important. So that's something that I've, I'm a huge advocate of whenever possible is that, that equal custody or the equal shared time with, with the kids. And, um, and I, really kind of just try and another book I really adore is is called a happy divorce and it's just all about like trying to throwing out all as much animosity out the window as you can and just trying to kind of like get along as well as you can obviously for the benefit of the kids but just generally it just makes everything easier and um I just kind of like rise above and don't try and try not to kind of like get too caught up in any kind of of the, the the conflict and it's surprisingly easy for me. I know it's not always easy um, for everybody, but I try to kind of really like lean into the benefits of the blended co blended family and this kind of village that we've created. And I remember, and I have those moments. I remember I was at a recital pre-pandemic where um, we saw all these kind of nuclear families and they were all there for their kids. And I was like, mm. and then I looked at us and like my family was taking up like a whole aisle <laughs> in the auditorium because it was like, it was like, the, um, it was like my boyfriend at the time, um, my ex's girlfriend, my parents, like it was like, and I'm much closer with my parents probably in some ways because of being a single mom. So it's like my, I, I, I see them more and there's, I'm more kind of like open to the, to the village than I might've been before. So 
I sort of just feel like, you know, and so now my daughter, um, so she spends half the time with her dad and her dad lives with his girlfriend and they have a new baby actually. So she's, she has a sister, um, who's, uh, at this point, I think it's like almost six months old. So she's getting to be a sister, um, on that side. And then she, um, spends the other half of the time with me. And then we try to do things together. Um, and you do have those sort of surreal moments where I was in the playground and um <laughs> my current boyfriend was having like making small talk with my ex-husband and it was one of those like moments when you know we were all talking about my daughter was playing in the playground it was kind of one of those beautiful moments but also those surreal moments where you're like only in co-parenting do you have your like <laughs> your ex yes. making small talk with your current boyfriend and that's normal um yeah. so yeah there's definitely like weird kind of moments but um overall you know we try to do things like you know, I might, I could even see us all going to Disney world when that's a possibility mm-hmm. and doing things like that. And that just, and it makes it, it means that for me, I get half the time to myself too. And to, and I think there is more that like even nuclear families, people who are, you know, two parent households could benefit from. I do think that that time away from my daughter makes me a better mom. Cause I can recharge a little bit. So anyway, that's the sort of spiel. I don't, I think there's definitely been some interesting learnings and um, and positives out of all of it. It doesn't have to be, you know, divorce doesn't necessarily have to be negative and being a single mom doesn't have to be negative either. So it's sort of changing that conversation a little bit. Yeah, that sounds so beautiful. I think that it's so great that you guys can come together and do that and just like create something so much bigger because even though you guys are divorced, like you had a child together, you know, and I know not everybody's situation can be so positive like that, but just Mm -hmm. to be able to grow something, because it doesn't yeah. go away that you had a child with that person. So I think that's really great. Totally. I also think like it's, I always say that there are different skills. It's crazy that we expect in our society that someone to be a perfect partner, a perfect um, parent, you know, a perfect friend um, and, and be that same person and have that be the norm. Like, you know, that's, that that's where it's also kind of been. I genuinely think that my daughter's dad is the best dad in the world. Like he's awesome. Dad, mm-hmm. he's not my, he's not right. as my husband. Right. But isn't it wild that like, <laughs> that, that like, but of course he's still the best dad ever. And, and so those are almost like two totally separate. Those can kind of be like two totally separate things in a way, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can respect the positive things about him and yep. realize that, you know, he has this quality, but this doesn't work for right. us. As a couple. Exactly. Totally. So. If you could give a tip for somebody who is maybe currently co-parenting or they might be new to co-parenting would do you think that something like that would be your tip or what do you think? Yeah, I think just don't, um, don't, first of all, yeah, I think, think about the good in them and think about their skills and, and, and know that it doesn't like, it doesn't, they can be a great dad and maybe not a great partner. And those can be two different skills. I think also don't sweat the small stuff. I really think just let things go, let things go for the most part, let it go, you know, try not to, I really, we, we didn't have any, we didn't, we just sort of like, split down the middle when we got divorced and really didn't make money a part of it. And like the more you can just don't fight over tiny things, think about the big picture because the most important thing out of a divorce, if you're a parent is not, it's my opinion is not the money is not the, the setup. It's absolutely your relationship with the other parent, because that the, if that can remain intact, then everything's going to be easier when you're, you know, raising your kid together. And, you know, then you can just work, you know, make decisions around camp and school and all these things that have to be done all the time. And if you can make those decisions and be friends, that is worth its weight in so much gold. So that's, that's my tip is let things go and don't fight about stupid stuff like money, if you can avoid it. And you know, just don't sweat the small stuff. And if, listen, if they're, they're not perfect all the time and neither are you, and if you can let things go and not argue over everything, you'll sort of, that'll pay dividends. Nice. Yeah. That's a great tip. I do like that. So I I love that you guys, the idea of all of you going to Disney world together, it sounds amazing, but that (laughs) is such, that's so special for your daughter too, to be able to see you all getting along and like feel like yeah. it's one big happy family that's really beautiful yeah and I think similar to what we're talking about with the pandemic and masks for her we separated when she was one so like mm-hmm. for her this is like the normal you know yeah. and I think like she I, I mean I do know that she's gonna start to learn about what other people's families look like and mm-hmm. maybe see that hers is different but 
it's another example where I think it's almost like harder on us sometimes than it is, is even on her. Like she's, yeah. she's like just very cool with it all. Yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like we're seeing a big transition in what like an actual family looks like these days. Yeah. And we're so excited to dig into the diversity of family life in America today. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about your podcast about this topic and how you got started with that? Of course. Yeah. So this was um, for, you know, it's kind of a good segue because it's just from selfish for selfish reasons. I remember I was looking at, um, I'd be looking at Instagram and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I was uh, at my daughter's recital and I found myself kind of like jealous of the perfect, what I thought was like the perfect family um, and the sort of like nuclear family. And then I started to see statistics that said that like non-traditional families were about to outnumber the number of like traditional nuclear families. And I think even 2020 or 2021 and by non-traditional families, I mean, like, you know, like co-parenting or blended families or, or, um, multi-generational households, um, or, you know, parents who are having kids through IVF or adoption or fostering. And so I thought to myself, um, I would love to hear people's stories about that. You know, the more I can kind of like talk about them and talk about the diversity of families and also the, the more we can show how, how it's love that makes a family and not necessarily how it's made up, um, the better. And so I, so that was my idea for the podcast with We Are Family. I just wanted to kind of like tell the stories of all these different unique ways that people became and were families. And then I was sort of thinking about co-hosts and we had featured Sean T of the Insanity Workout on one of our covers of Parents Magazine. And he is um, dad to twin boys with his husband who they had through surrogacy. So he had a totally interesting, unique parenting journey to parenthood. And then I had an, my own unique situation with parenthood. So we kind of came together and then, yeah, every episode we talk about different um different setups, whether that's through fostering or whether that's adoption or IVF. Um, but also we touch on LGB uh, parenting and LGBTQ child. Um, we talked to Ali Sheedy for one episode and her son Beckett, who's transgender and just really, you know, talk to her about what that was like as a parent and going, you know, her son going through all that. And so yeah, it was just, it's really like a lot of emotional moments. I was, I cried a few times doing that podcast because it's definitely like very like raw stories, but really kind of important. I think the more people see that, that families, no two family look like, looks alike and no, there's no normal when it comes to being a family. I think, again, it's just about making everybody else feel less alone and validated. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I, um, when I was growing up, we had like the perfect quote unquote family, at least in my eyes as a kid, and then becoming an adult, my parents divorced when I was a grown adult and just like mm -hmm. living in my little bubble of this perfect family made it so much harder when that actually happened as an adult to yeah. kind of deal with that. So I just think it's so important that people are talking about these things and that people are opening up their eyes to realize that there's other types of family out there. Mm -hmm. And there's just, you know, mainstream media just needs to be talking about this more and just making it easier for people to see outside of their own little bubbles with families and obviously everything. But yeah. I and I think it's so that. important to kind of like model good relationships for your kids. So like a lot of times, you know, we have that conversation of like, people have that conversation of like, whether you should stay together for the kids. And I have, you know, friends who ask me about that a lot. And my personal opinion is that like, you know, it's important to show your kids what a good relationship looks like. So if you're not in a good relationship, that's not beneficial for the kid either, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it's tough, but, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely important that I, that, you know, we come out of this Instagram filtered culture and really try to kind of show that nobody's perfect and not even nuclear families, quote unquote, per, you know, traditional families are ever perfect either. So, um, and the more we can talk about that, the happier, hopefully we all are. <laughs> yeah. And I think even within like your own within your own family, like letting your children see that there's no such thing as people being perfect all the time. Like mm -hmm. I, for the longest time, I was like, I will never fight in front of my kids. Like this was one of those things I will never do in front of the kids. Yeah. And I did like a lot of research on this because my parents never, ever fought in front of us. Like if they mm -hmm. were having a discussion, it was like, I remember they'd go into the garage and my sisters and I would lay on the ground, like trying to listen that. to what they were saying. I remember that too. Yeah. yeah totally. so did, like so much research on it. And 
I now I just like really enjoy having a productive fight in front of yes. my daughter so that she can see the outcome that mm-hmm. it's okay to be angry and it's okay for things to not be perfect all the time, but we still love each other and we can make a resolution and yes. hopefully she can start to as her toddler <laughs> brain is growing. <laughs> oh my gosh. She can start to realize like, okay, I can like, calm myself down and come up with yes. a resolution. <laughs> It's leading yeah. by example and it's giving your kids tools to be able to, to do these things. And I think it's, it's similar to like talking about sex. It's similar to talk, you know, I've had conversations recently about like, do you let your kids go on to social, to social media, you know, when they're old enough, when they're 13 or like, do you not? And it's like, well, listen, they're going to do these things anyway. They're going to have relationships where they're fighting. We, you know, where you have arguments and nothing is perfect. Um, I was in therapy earlier and my therapist was talking about this very same thing. Like there is no good, no good relationship where you don't have conflict. Mm -hmm. So if they don't know how to do conflict, then you're not setting them up with the tools, very important tools for, for life. Um, you know, and that's also, I think an exercise in trying to have healthier conflict yourself, if you're going to model it for your kids, which means not just like screaming at the other person and yelling, you know, and it's like about having that, it is about having that, that managed, um, conflict yourself. And I think, so everybody benefits because that's the right way to, to do it anyway, to, Mm -hmm. it's good to fight well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to have those like it's a weird thing to say it's kind of nice to fight in front of your kids but they do give you that like okay there's an audience here I need to be yeah. very mindful of how I discuss this and <laughs> things you usually have a lot better outcome when you're not so just like wildly emotional and yep. like being mean I mean we can sometimes mm-hmm. be kind of mean so yeah yeah it can be really helpful in front of them mm-hmm. yeah it's not always easy I think certainly during the right. pandemic it's like those buttons get pushed so <laughs> yep <laughs> um yeah we try our best. So are there any new parenting trends that are up and coming that we should know about or get ready for? Oh gosh. Um, new parenting trends again. Like I, I think I feel like everybody's coming out of the pandemic. I feel like this might be a time for like free range parenting. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like people are going to be like, go out, get out, go socialize, you know, um, don't come back till dinner. No, probably not. But, um, but I do think that there's probably a, a level of like, you know, parents just really wanting to kind of make up for that lack of social socialization and like, just let their kids go and have fun. I think like, I know for myself, all these things got put on hold. Like my daughter doesn't know how to swim yet. Really. We started pre-pandemic and then pandemic and then still she doesn't know. And then like, you know, I want to get her to ride a bike and all that kind of like just basic kid stuff, I feel like. But in terms of trends, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it's just kind of continuing that trajectory, I would say, um, of moving away from that helicopter parenthood, parenting and moving in favor of that sort of like giving our kids autonomy and freedom and you know with with boundary within boundaries and with safely obviously um but just really kind of and and I think like being better about uh, acknowledging our kids emotions and talking to them about that um and I think also you know just in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement and everything, I think like there's also, it's not, hopefully it's not a trend. It's just, a, it's a reality that will stick around, but I think parents are becoming better about talking to their kids. I always say it's like, a, that's why privilege, if you have to think about when you're going to talk to your kid about race, you know, because uh, as a white woman, I have that, that privilege to be able to be like, hmm, is now the right time? Whereas, you know, black, black families do not have that privilege. Mm-hmm. Um so anyway, I think, but I think families are getting more comfortable talking about race and, you know, talking about, um, and then over the summer I was, you know, going to protests with my daughter, Black Lives Matter protests and things like that. And so it's, I think really there's a overarching trend, I think, towards raising good citizens. And we changed our motto at, um, our tagline at Parents Magazine that's now, and it's now raising the future. And it's all about the fact that Um, There's been a lot of research that millennial parents and younger generations care more about raising good citizens and good people, good people versus the smartest kid, you know, Mm -hmm. but you're not like, there's like this move away from really pushing people to be like to kids to be straight A's and, you know, president or a rocket scientist. I think a lot of this generation of parents are just like, I just want to make sure that my kid is a good person. Mm -hmm. So I think we're seeing that and I, and it's, and that's very reassuring. 
And I hope that it continues in that way. I, I mean, I certainly feel that way. I just want my, my daughter to, um, to be a nice and a nice person and a good person. And I think that that's, what's most important to me too. So I can totally relate. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I am so happy that that is kind of what is happening around us and just yeah. for our kids to be able to see other people speak out about what's right and to actually mm-hmm. be people themselves and we try to lead by as much example as possible to her. And even in the media that's happening, like what we let her consume where she's seeing people that are actually speaking up and sharing and using their voice so that when she's big enough or even now, like she's confident enough to do that herself because that hasn't been, I mean, you know, I feel like for a lot of us growing up in in the millennial bracket, Mm -hmm. like that Mm -hmm. wasn't really, what we were taught for most of the years that we were coming up. And so I think that's just so powerful. And it's just like, I'm happy we get to do that. (laughs) Especially as girls, I think Mm -hmm. like growing up, like how many, I feel like so many, it's so many girls, women can relate to growing up being told to like quiet down in the classroom and to like, you know, these things that are sort of subtly taught, taught to you as a, as, as a child, as a child, as a girl. And I think that's also super important raising a daughter, you know, I want to make sure she, she can use her voice. Um, I, I'm proud to say that I marched in the women's March in 2016, breastfeeding yeah. my daughter oh, as my I God. marched and Tina Fey was next to me. I was like, this is a moment. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Like a dream and, come and then I got a stiff neck after that. And so I had to get muscle oh. relaxants for my neck because I was like breastfeeding her and marching, but it was worth it. <laughs> it, was, it, it was worth it. But you know, I think it's so true. I think kids fairness is such a favorite topic for kids. Like kids get fairness justice for them is easy. Like they understand the concept of someone not being treated fairly. That's like their favorite topic of conversation in the playground. So I think it's like kids are ripe to have those conversations about what's right and what's not right. Cause it's just sort of like in their DNA at that age, at a young age anyway. Yes. Let it grow, water it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think it's a really interesting time to be a parent right now also because there's so many social issues going on or like human rights issues Mm -hmm. happening like in the media and I feel like in the past there's just been such a attitude of like oh well how do I talk to my children about this like how am I supposed to explain you know being transgender to a kid like they're not going to understand that even even some things as simple as like gay marriage I have a gay brother and Mm -hmm. he we went to his wedding to his partner my children never have like thought that that was weird yeah if they don't look an eye yeah no, they're like okay that's their normal. oh he's marrying a guy okay who cares yeah. like that's their total normal and yeah. I love that I love that and they're so resilient they are so much more understanding than adults are by far yeah so hopefully we can all like take this moment to teach our kids this stuff from a young age and just raise a much more tolerant caring generation in the future Oh, totally. And I think that's also, I feel like this is the theme of, of our conversation today is just that yeah. the kids are better at, at things sometimes than they we are. are. And sometimes totally. I think like, we think things are harder than, than, than they actually are for the kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's so true, but I think that there's obviously a role to play with in terms of like what books we read with our kids and how we mm-hmm. talk to them about yeah you know, trying not to have that totally like heteronormative conversation, you know, try to be Mm -hmm. really like, talk to them about what, you know, that it's not necessarily always like, or just, just framing it that it's, you know, a man or a man or a woman or a woman, you know, a man or woman, like love is love and, and making sure that you're reading them the right books to, to make sure that they're, they're exposed to a a diversity of, of what it means to, to be in love or what it means to have a family. And that I think is, a certain amount of, of, um, our role as a parent, but I also think that they, yeah, to your point, like it's not, it's not a thing for them. Like they're very, like whatever they are exposed to as normal as they're growing up, that's just what's normal for them. So, um, no, it's very, it's very, um, reassuring, I think. And I think there was time when we would kind of like, sort of like sweep things under the carpet. And I think there was a certain thing, you know, certainly our generation growing up, there was a, there was a lot of sort of talk around like not seeing race and like not talking about race and sort of being colorblind. And I think we've come full circle. Sesame street did a really good, that really good town hall about um, race. And they were talking about this very subject and it's like, you know, it's a kid notice differences. They don't think of them as like in one way or the other, but they'll notice that a kid looks different. So it's okay to like talk about things that are different and have that conversation. And that's important. And, you know, and, and so I think that's part of it too, is just, um, being open and having those conversations and not sweeping it under the 
the the the rug and and not feeling um uncomfortable with talking about how why, you know why someone might be different and and just being open about that with your kids so yeah yeah, yeah we're the grown-ups are the ones who make it weird so that's right <laughs> let's not make it weird <laughs> let's not make it weird <laughs> i know i think that politicians should be like required to like there should be a panel of kids to help make these decisions because they just keep it so simple and i love when my kids like this happened couple weeks ago my daughter um she's about to be eight but she loves basketball and she wants to grow up and be an nba player Mm -hmm. i'm like oh that you know that's awesome oh well it'll probably have to be the wnba and she was like why and i was like um i I was like i i mean i really don't know why i'm like probably because like men just are really big and i'd be worried about you getting smushed by them and she's like oh i wouldn't i'll be fine and i'm like i have no answer for you like oh there is one it's wild right it like, is that's wild. Just how it's been done. That doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah, good. Well, point. because there are women who are bigger than some men, and like right. it's it is there is no explanation. And I had that recently too with like my so my daughter's school has gotten really weird about dress code, which is odd because they're a pre-K and mm-hmm. they're like they they don't want their shoulders to be exposed. And at first they were like no no arms can be exposed. And I was like why? And then I saw pictures and their boys at school had their arms exposed. And I was like wait are you just saying this for the girls? It was wild. And, yeah. and they're like, Oh no, it's about temperature. I'm like two inches of fabric on their shoulders is about temperature. Like, what are we talking about here? Mm-hmm. And really, I, I don't care that much one way or the other, but w- the fact that I had to somehow explain to my four-year-old why she couldn't expose her shoulders. And I had no answer. Yeah. And that's the, to your point, that's exactly those moments in parenthood where you're like, wait, there is no answer. The kids, yeah. the kids really see it for what it is. And there's no way of explaining it without it being totally weird to them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I am waiting for the day that that dress code thing becomes. An <laughs> I issue didn't know because... I was going to have that day. That oh. day when she was four. Right. I'm still. Oh, I'm no. st- there, we re- rewrote a long letter, and I still send yeah. her in like <laughs> all last year, same school. She wore tank dresses. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. it's become a thing, and I don't know what's going on. But I wrote a letter, and I still send her in the tank dresses, mostly because yeah. I can't be bothered to have that fight when I'm che- if, <laughs> when she's getting dressed in the morning. It's hard enough. So if there's something on her and she's yeah. dressed and clothed mm. out the door, out the door, out the door. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Telling our kids, this is the way it's always been. We don't know why you can change it and just <laughs> setting them out there to change it. I think is what we have to do. We just have yeah. to. Absolutely. But we could literally talk to you all day. This has <laughs> been just like one of my favorite conversations we've ever had on the show. So thank you Aww. so much for coming on and talking so openly with us. We do have one final question that we ask all of our guests who come on. And that is your one piece of advice on how you balance being a mom and a boss lady. What would your one piece of advice be? Uh, hmm think like a man who might be asked that question. I don't know. Um, like who would have never be asked that question, but, um, no, I think, I think it's just, you got to be unop- unapologetic. So yes, think like a man, you have to be unapologetic about it. And like, don't question the fact that you ha- you're a boss and you have a career. I think I had the, the pleasure or the, the, the privilege of growing up with a mom who was a, a, a full-time um, she worked full time and her career is, is, is extremely important to her. She works in show business. She's a costume designer, but, um, I just grew up with a, and she worked very long hours cause she worked in movies and TV and, and it was just normal for me. And it's that same thing. It's that thread that's going through this whole conversation. Like what I grew up with is normal. I, it didn't even question the fact that she was like, you know, total boss lady. And I think like that just inspired me growing up to be like, okay, well, that's just what I do. And then I also be a mom, you know, it's a no, no thing. And I think like, it's don't, I have a lot of friends who have tremendous guilt for working long hours. And I'm like, do not, there's evidence to show that it it is beneficial to the kids to see you in your career and rocking it. And especially, you know, boys, certainly girls, certainly boys also, because, you know, seeing their moms just, just killing it in their career. So I think my biggest piece of advice is like own it and don't feel don't feel guilty for, for having that career and for, for sometimes working those long hours. Um, I'm as close with my mom as anybody, anybody is. And it don't think that the amount of it's the quality, it's not always the quantity of hours you spend in a day with your kids. So that's what I would say. Yes. Great advice. I love that. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us. Um, 
before we let you finally go, um, it's time for our hot mess moment, which is probably our favorite segment. So life is full of those hot mess moments and we've all been there. So do you have a moment that you were a total hot mess that you'd like to share with us? Um, I had this one funny moment the other day when I was picking my daughter up from school. And um, so talking about co-parenting, my, uh, her, my daughter's dad's girlfriend is excellent at doing her hair. Um, and her teacher, the teaching assistant was like, her hair was so great the other day. What did you do? And I was like, that was not me. Uh, <laughs> that's my, that's my daughter. That's my daughter's dad's girlfriend who can do that. And the teaching assistant was like, oh, I'm like, no, no, I'm like the, the messy hair. Like that the rest of the days of the week when it doesn't look like that, that that's me. And she was like, oh, well, we can't have all the talents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my it's like ouch <laughs> wow she's like I'm sure that you bring it and basically she said something like I'm sure you bring other things <laughs> yeah oh my like, gosh okay okay thank you that's thank so you. uncomfortable <laughs> oh my gosh. so anyway oh. my hot mess moment is every morning sending my daughter with like because <laughs> She's got long hair and teachers want her hair up all the time. And it's a, big, it's a, it's a big fight. So I'm always there with a the hairband, just like if I can get it into a ponytail or pigtails and out the door, um, oh that's a win. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, well, we are going to let you go. Thank you again so much for joining us before we let you go. Let's hear where everybody can find you, give you a follow, support you in any way. Feel free to share anything you've got going on. Sure. So the website's parents.com. That's what I run. And, um, uh, I'm at, at Julia Dennison, uh, on Instagram. And then we also have at parents is our handle on Instagram for parents magazine too. So if you want to hit follow and my DMS are open and, oh, I'm on clubhouse too. So if anyone's out there on clubhouse, then Julia Dennison on clubhouse also. Awesome. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Julia, everyone else. Uh, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Boss Ladies and Babies. If you like this episode, be sure to rate, review, and leave us some feedback. Make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and join the conversation in our Facebook group at Boss Ladies and Babies. And until next time, stay, stay bossy. bossy.